Tony Romo is weighing his options on life after Dallas. Colin Kaepernick has a change of heart. The busboys tried a coup and failed. The Jets have made major changes. What signals are they sending? Baseball is back. And of course, we have an update on the Knicks and Nets. And stick around and hear who's on the bench this week. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports. Coming right up. On to the Tony Romo show, Keisha. Tony Romo, the aging and often injured Dallas Cowboy quarterback, feels he still has the skills and he wants to compete for a Super Bowl. Some of the teams that are looking at Romo, namely the Kansas City Chiefs, the Denver Broncos, and of course the Houston Texans as well. If these teams would not work out for Romo, he's said to be interested, Keisha, in the San Francisco 49ers and also going to Los Angeles. Keisha, looking into your crystal ball, I ask you, What's the most likely landing spot for Tony Romo? I'm going to say that Houston is probably the likely landing spot for him. I think that they're the team best suited for him and who he is and what he needs at this point of his career. They have a strong offensive line. They've got weapons and wide receivers. They have a top-rated defense, and they're getting J.J. Watt back. And they are really close to being contenders because – the division that they're in is very weak and they have a chance to win their conference and then make it to maybe the Super Bowl because even without a quality quarterback like Tony Romo, the, uh, they held the Patriots pretty much in check during the playoff game last season. So I think that's probably the best spot for him. I think Houston would be a good spot. I've been cheer- I've been hoping for Denver. I think John Elway with an opportunity to bring in an aging quarterback once again who has had some success. Obviously, he did it before with Peyton Manning, and now another opportunity to get Tony Romo. I think one misconception I'll finish with about Tony Romo is that he's going to come in and be a top five, maybe even a top ten quarterback. I don't see that. I think that he's coming in here to compete, to be a quarterback that's going to be able to get some wins, but I don't see him going back to his old form. And also, this is a guy that gets very injured, is injured very often often so we'll see how it all shakes out yeah so we're going to talk from about one quarterback in dallas and we're going to go over to the west coast in san francisco and talk about colin kaepernick the 49ers quarterback is now saying that he will no longer kneel during the u.s national anthem what do you think about this about about face well, you know, cue the hypocrisy talk from a lot of people that are saying that Colin Kaepernick did this as an intention to seek attention from people. Uh, look, I think what Colin Kaepernick did, whether or not he's going to continue to do this, and obviously he said that he's going to stop, I think that this shed a lot of light on racial issues within this country, and I think that it was good of him to do this. And this is coming, being a white guy, I think that it was good for me to see some things that necessarily other athletes hadn't necessarily spoken about beforehand. I think the protest of the, of the national anthem, I think, worked out in his favor. I think Kaepernick is being smart here, okay? He knows that he's a free agent. He knows that teams that are looking to bring him in to their franchise, they don't want to deal with some of this negative speculation and the controversy that surrounds this. So I think so far what Kaepernick was able to do, I commend him for it. I really do. And I think moving forward, I'm rooting for the best for him. I'd like to see him resurrect his career and get some, you know, be a good quarterback again. Yeah, I think the cynical view is that he did it the timing with his free agency and the the not uh, kneeling during the anthem is coincidental. And maybe there is a little bit of self-preservation hidden in there. But the fact is that he can't kneel forever. I, I think his heart is definitely in the right place. I think he probably fumbled his way through this a little bit because when he first started the protest, he said, and I'm going to kind of chop this up a little bit, but he said that when there's significant change, this is a quote, I, and I feel that the flag represents what it's supposed to represent, and this country is representing people the way it's supposed to, I'll stand. Now we fast forward about six to eight months later, and we're now under a new regime in 
the presidency and this regime is now enacting laws to oppress a certain people who happen to be of color of a different of a religious persuasion and then there are acts of harassment and violence being perpetrated against minorities in the name of this president you know when you see the graffiti it's his name and as it, as uh, the impetus for it and you don't see the president um reaching out saying like this is wrong and, and you know saying denouncing this behavior so it, it's kind of weird that he's not going to stand when this is still happening but um and then also he had the castro shirt and the socks with the pigs and uniforms so he's kind of fumbled his way through it but even though he's not going to kneel anymore he's still putting his time and his money where his mouth is and he's he's really done some really nice work in the community certainly i think i'll finish with this like i think not only has this become sort of a black and white issue that kaepernick has touched on but i think also maybe even more than that it's been a liberal and conservative issue as well where liberals have been in support of kaepernick for what he's been able to do and i've seen on a lot of these message boards on a lot of these websites some of the racist and and just anti colin kaepernick stuff that really just from from my standpoint makes me sick to my stomach yeah, it's really disgusting. And to his credit, he has suffered those slings and arrows and really has, you know, stood pat in his beliefs and didn't didn't think twice about um, sitting down after people have said some really nasty things about him. Well, it'll be interesting to see where he winds up in this offseason. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. So when we go back to the NBA Key Show, where we spoke last week about Magic Johnson rejoining the Los Angeles Lakers front office. But after Jeannie Buss's big shakeup to the Lakers front office, her brothers tried to elect a new board of directors that would exclude her from the original board that she would, so that she could not gain control over the team. Jeannie and her legal team shut that maneuver down. Overall, Keisha, I ask you, is this a bad look for the Lakers? Is it a bad look for the NBA? And could this possibly create a toxic environment for Magic Johnson as he's trying to steer the ship in the right direction for Los Angeles? It doesn't look good for the Lakers at all, and particularly Jim Buss. I mean, I like to say when people are misbehaving, they need to get their, their life right. And Jim Buss needs to get his life right. He gave himself a deadline to turn the Lakers into contenders, not only in the Western Conference, but for a final. Those three, four years are up, and they, the, the Lakers have gone, you know, talk about a fall from grace. They're one of the most storied franchises in NBA history, and they've been bottom dwellers, and it's been at his helm. And Jeannie held him to his word, and she decided to not only keep him to his word, but do what's best for Laker Nation. This is not what her father would have wanted. And her father put her in charge to make these kind of decisions. And Jim Buzz and uh, Jim and Johnny, did I name? Yeah. The two brothers, they look like babies who just got their pacifiers taken away and now they're crying about it. So I think for Jeannie, it's going to be tough, but she does have an ally in Magic Johnson. And I will say that if this kind of uh, power play um, continues. It might be a little harder for Magic Johnson to draw in some free agents because you know who wants to go into a situation where there's ownership is a mess. Yeah, the toughest thing for someone to be who's brought into a front office and given control, it's very hard when there's an issue at stake with ownership. I think one person who's going to be unscathed by all this, of course, is a big, big, big face of the franchise of the Los Angeles Lakers, Magic Johnson. In other words, because he's there, I don't think that this will affect him so much because he's Magic Johnson and he has this history with the Lakers in the past. What I'll finish with, though, is this is... Now, New York isn't the only front office where there's an issue with the front office, right. um, you know, with James Dolan and everything. So, you know, and who knows what's going to happen. And to Phil Jackson. That's actually. true. <laughs> Oddly enough. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but I think going forward, I think as far as whether or not this is a bad look for the NBA, I think more so it's not a good look for the Lakers. And as you pointed out, you know, Jerry Buss is probably rolling over in his grave. This was a guy who had stability in his control when he was the owner of the Lakers. And now it seems like everything has just gone kaput. Yes, I hope they get this right because I need the Lakers and Magic to go back to glory. <laughs> the average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks.
Big story over the last week has been this injury to Kevin Durant. The Golden State Warriors, they really hit a major bump on their road to a championship that they're hoping for with this injury. Keisha, I ask you, how concerned should the Warriors be with Kevin Durant expected to be out at least four weeks? I think they should be concerned. I wouldn't push the panic button yet. They still have a chance to make it out of the Western Conference and into the finals, but it's going to be a little more difficult because they're going to have to find a way to find somebody to not only absorb KD's minutes, but his effectiveness. effectiveness. He's an excellent scorer. He's actually their their shot block leader, and that's what they need. And they've got the Spurs in the conference, the Houston Rockets. So I think their road is going to be a little more difficult, but I won't panic just yet. Yeah, I think as you pointed out, this opens up a big window for the Houston Rockets and the San Antonio Spurs, who are now chasing the Golden State Warriors in the Western Conference. They're still going to be the team to beat when the playoffs roll around. No question about that, but I think that this hurts chemistry a little bit, and this is not the same Warrior team that lost in the finals to the Cleveland Cavs last year. Their bench is not the same, and so we'll see how that all shakes out. But stick with us, because we've got a lot more to talk about in our New York Sports Report. But before that, we're going to talk some Baylor basketball. Keep it right here. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Baylor women's basketball head coach Kim Mulkey had a fiery message to Baylor detractors when it came to the sexual assault cases at Baylor. She then later issued a mea culpa, and at the same time, former men's football head coach Art Bryles took an opportunity to declare his innocence. Mike, what do you think about what's going on at Baylor? I'll get to Art Bryles in a second. You know, with Kim Mulkey, for a lot of critics are saying here, well, what took her so long to go ahead and comment on the whole situation at the school? I think she was just protecting her asset, which is the women's college basketball team. The issue I have is she's made some comments as well about parents that are skeptical about sending their kids to, to to Baylor, did she say that maybe we should knock them down or mm-hmm. get physical or something like that? Knock them in the face. Knock them in the <laughs> face, exactly. So I think Kim Mulkey, I think that she's made some mistakes, and I think she realizes that, and she's backtracked a little bit here. She's been open about the mistakes that she's made, and she's lashed out at all the all the, situ- the situation that's gone on here at Baylor, and she's been open about it. So I do give her some credit there. Now, as far as Art Bryles is concerned, just shut up, Art Bryles. This guy needs to keep his mouth shut. Move on. If you want to get an NFL team to possibly hire you as a scout or an offensive coordinator or something like that, which there are teams that could use his help because he's a great, innovative, offensive mind. Just go away. This guy has no business ever being another college, being a college football coach again with all the issues that went on there. But I have a big problem with Art Browse. Just move on and stop. Yeah, I mean, I had an issue with Kim Mulkey. My, my first part of her, when what made me wince was when she, she said that um, this was happening in colleges all across America. And, you know, Baylor had a report of 50 rapes or sexual assaults in a four-year period. If this was happening across the country, especially in these big powerhouse football schools, we would know about it. And even if it was a widespread epidemic, does it make Baylor's transgressions any better or any worse? And, you know, I, I have the cynical view of, Where was she when this was happening? We didn't hear from her. And when she issued her apology statement, she made mention that she's a woman. She's a mother of a daughter who goes to Baylor. She is a mother-like figure to the, the women on her team. And, you know, any of these women could have been her daughter. It could have been any one of her, uh, women on her team. Where was this outrage? So I had, I was like, ooh, but, I hope that this is the opportunity to see where she goes with this. If she channels this passion and, and, and fieriness, if, is that the word? Fieriness? I think so, yeah. Oh, we'll go with it. Um, towards you know making the changes at Baylor because Baylor is going to be under scrutiny going forward. Absolutely. There's no question about it. And, and I think, as you pointed out, you know Kim Mulkey, um, at least she's shown some passion here yeah. about, what, about the situation that's going on. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, I teased you and our friends out there by saying that March is one of my favorite months. And do you want to know why it is? Why is that, Keisha? March Madness! That's why this is one of the most exciting times of the year for me. Pardon me. I have to apologize in advance to all of my supervisors because, nah, you know, 
It's March Madness. I don't know how much work I'm actually going to get done for about a couple of weeks, but Mike, I'm, I'm excited. I've got my team going on right here. Who do you think could win it all? Do you have any sleeper picks? What do you think going into March Madness? Well, the experts are saying that this is an open tournament that a lot of teams can go out and, and, and win the whole thing. Anywhere from 15 to possibly even 20 teams have an opportunity to make it to the Final Four. I think when you look at the top 10, top 15 teams in the land, really Villanova and Kansas are two teams that just jump at me as the two best teams in the country. But... Not fo not fa far behind. You have teams like Duke, North Carolina, of course, Kentucky. Uh, the ACC is completely packed, so it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out. But from my perspective, I think this is this is the year that Bill Self gets that second title. I think Kansas is going to win the whole thing. Well, you know who I'm rooting for. These four letters right here, and they are number one in my heart. So I am really hoping that my team can pull this together. It's been a tale of two Duke teams this season. They have the, the ability, when it's all clicking on all cylinders, to be the prohibited favorites that they were. I mean, before the season started, people had predicted Duke would cut down the nets and win that championship. So I'm hoping that team shows up in the tournament, we've got the ACC tournament going on here in Brooklyn. So we'll see how they do in this tournament, and then we're waiting for the big dance. But like you said, there are a lot of teams that have the, the ability to win it. There hasn't been a team that's really been super dominant over the course of the season. We've seen a lot of shakeups in the top ten. So I think Duke is in it. Kansas, I know Kansas is always one of those funny picks. Every time I pick them to go far, they, they lose. They in the first, lose. Second round, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so they can be a potential bracket buster. Um, you know, Syracuse. You mentioned the ACC and how deep it is. Syracuse is one of those teams. They're kind of on the bubble, but they may be able to make a little noise in the tournament. They've got that that pesky 2-3 zone that sometimes gives people trouble. So we'll see. I'm rooting for my Blue Devils. Let's go, Big Blue. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. We're in a New York state of mind, and it looks like the New York Jets were doing some spring cleaning. The New York Jets released wide receiver Brandon Marshall, Nick Mangold, Darrell Rivas, and Nick Folk. And the New York Giants signed Jason Pierre-Paul to the franchise tag and said goodbye to fan favorite Victor Cruz. Mike, what do you think about these moves by the Jets and the Giants? First for the Jets, uh, tough to see Nick Mangold go. You know, this is a guy who's been a staple for this franchise for a number of years. He's been a j lifelong Jet, so that's kind of tough to see him go. As far as the Jets are concerned, uh, it's a mess right now in the front office. Not only that, but uh, you know, Todd Bowles has had a tough couple of seasons right now as the head coach of the team. Until they find a quarterback, something that they can at least be a stopgap for the next year or two seasons, they're in a, in a world of trouble. As far as the Giants are concerned, also kind of tough to see Victor Cruz go. This is a guy who's been a Super Bowl champion for this team, uh, and we've seen him. his skills have diminished, let's be honest about that, over the course of the last couple of seasons. Uh, and the Giants, even though obviously they, they have a lot of talent on the defensive side of the ball, uh, they have a lot of question marks as they head into this offseason, so we'll see how it all shakes out. But for right now, uh, two guys, Nick Mangold and Victor Cruz, who have been two New Yorkers, uh, it's going to be tough to see them leave. Yeah, I mean, the Jets have definitely made moves to go younger, and they're clearing cap space to address some of the issues that they have, the quarterback being the most crucial one, because if you don't have a good quarterback, you're pretty much dead in the water. So we'll see what moves they make. And Todd Bowles, his, his future is going to be interesting because he was kind of on the hot seat after this last season, and he got a pass because the season before they had a nice record. But with this rebuilding phase, I wonder what's going to become of Todd Bowles, how much leeway he has. And the Giants, oh, I'm so sad to see Victor Cruz go. I, I love doing the salsa, and he was just such a really – uh, pleasant personality, a, a winner, and um, I'm sad to see him go. I understood, and I knew it was going to come because of his play being diminished by the injuries. JPP is still staying. They're still trying to work out a long-term deal with him, and they may lose Jonathan Hankins in the process because they're running on some cap, uh, salary cap limitations. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Baseball is finally back, and the New York Mets made a big move last week where they signed Noah Syndergaard to a contract for $605,000. And also, bad news here in the Big Apple regarding David Wright. It's not looking too good right now, Keisha. I know. Can I just say that uh, that seems kind of cheap for Noah Syndergaard. I mean, what happens at baseball? I guess his payday is coming somewhat soon, I hope. But 
in terms of David Wright, it's not looking good for him. He's expected to miss at least a few weeks as he's continuing to have pain when he's throwing and he hasn't even really attempted to swing the bat yet. He has um, some pain in the shoulder and he had some lower back issues and neck problems over the course of uh, last season. So they're trying, he's optimistic and the doctors are giving him a chance to uh, play again, but it's going to be something that can't be rushed and he has to take his rehab. I mean, not that he wouldn't take it seriously, but really focus on the rehab and, and the exercises and what they're prescribing for him to do in order for him to have the best chance at coming back on the diamond. Yeah, all baseball fans are sad to see this to ha see this happening to David Wright, not just here in New York. The guy's been a perennial all-star, and he's had a great career. Could be a blessing in disguise for the Mets, though, because what happens here is this maybe opens up some windows for some of their younger talent where they can plug someone in at third base and see how that all shakes out. So, again, this is something similar to what happened with, I read Joel Sherman's article in the New York Post recently, comparing David Wright at this stage of his career to where Don Mattingly was when he was at, reached his th mid-30s, and you see this huge decline. So uh, I hope the best for David Wright from here on out. I yeah. really do. I'd like to see him back on the diamond. Same here. And Gotham City got back the Dark Knight. What do they call him? The Dark Knight? The Dark Prince? Matt Harvey. So he pitched in his first game since surgery uh, last July, and his first outing was perfect. Um, the second subsequent um, innings, he... Uh, got tied for a three-run home run, and some of the velocity is not quite there. But Harvey and uh, team manager uh, Terry Collins are concerned. Yet, you know, this is going to be something that's going to uh, pr he's going to progress. You know, this is his first time pitching in uh, almost a year, so you know, it's 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 good to see him back to to see some of flashes of the the old Matt Harvey, and we're looking forward to him. Yeah, I am. Mets fans will be crossing their fingers first couple of months of the season for every Harvey start, no question about it, because this guy's had some issues recently. However, uh, he is really one of, the, one of the big stoppers that they have in that great rotation. They're going to be duking it out with the Nationals all season, so they know that they're going to have to have Matt Harvey ready to go if they want to make a move. The Nets notched an impressive road win against the Memphis Grizzlies, and Jeremy Lin was really instrumental in a fourth quarter rally. He scored nine straight points that really gave Brooklyn the cushion that they needed to separate themselves from the, the Grizzlies. So this is a nice win for them. This is something that they need. Look, this is this is the team has the worst record, or, or one of the wor worst record in the NBA, I think, at the moment. If not, pretty, yeah. <laughs> if so. It's not as if they're going to make this miraculous recovery and find, you know, wind up competing for an eighth seed in the Eastern Conference, but you still want to save face a little bit here, and getting wins like this is really what can still somewhat generate a buzz. I've been to some Brooklyn Net games this season, and it's not like the place is completely empty. There are still our fans that are passionate about their basketball, and they want to see this team find a way to turn it around. Yeah, and I've learned in life that small successes lead to big successes. So once you see yourself doing, you know, making little progress, that gives you more self-confidence to keep going. So this this is really nice and we'll see how it keeps going. So we're going to go from the Nets to the Knicks in Manhattan and they did something a little different um, in their game against the Golden State Warriors. For the first half of the game there was no music, no in-game entertainment. It got mixed reviews from the players, the fans. There was weird, creepy, it was a church-like setting. Those were some of the terms that were used by both members of the Warriors and the Knicks. Mike, what did you think about this? I, I enjoyed it. I mean, obviously I wasn't at the game, but I thought that this is something that's interesting. Having been to a number of Knicks games this season, maybe three or four games, one of my complaints that I have going to the Garden is there's this constant music, constant stuff that, that distracts you during the timeouts. Uh, I mean, look, I love the Knicks City dancers, I love the Knicks Junior dances, dancers, but uh, they don't have to be, keep entertaining us during the timeouts with with all the, and the music just blasting and blasting i thought it was interesting now the last thing i'll say about it i don't like draymond green and steph curry uh ripping it apart like they did in the, after the game i mean i'm glad i didn't go because i wouldn't like it i like razzle dazzle it's part of going to the game part of the experience i like dancing i, I don't like the t-shirts because they never throw them in my section so i never get one so they can get rid of that but i like to see some dancing and the music pumping and so I, I wouldn't have liked it. So <laughs> We'll stick with us because find out because Keisha's putting someone either in the doghouse or on the bench or something much worse. So keep it here. <laughs> Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, nearly every week when someone's acting up, we put them on the bench. But when they really act up, they 
get in that doghouse. Keisha, you're on. Well, Dr. Larry Nasser is going in that doghouse because he is something else. 18 girls and women recently filed a federal lawsuit against disgraced gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser and three organizations associated with him, alleging that no one tried to stop him from molesting patients under the guise of medical treatment. Keisha, I saw this special on this about maybe a week or so ago. I forget what channel it was on. I couldn't stomach it. I had to change the channel. It was so disturbing. I think that this is a case specifically uh, these poor women treated so bad, poorly the way that this has been coming out. I think that this guy belongs in prison. There's no doghouse and, and, and the bench. It's not enough for this guy. I, he needs to go underneath the prison. I, I mean, when I heard, or it's not heard, read the details of the abuse that happened and I was just, it was cringeworthy. I couldn't even believe it. It was so disgusting. And it just strikes me how these women, these young women, young girls, were isolated in the sense because he was associated with the Carolis, who are really well known in terms of U.S. women in gymnastics. They are famed coaches. They have a ranch where they train these young ladies, and the parents don't necessarily go with them. And so here they are alone without their parents with coaches who a couple of the accusers say that were did not encourage a lot of dialogue. It, they they ruled with an iron fist and then you have this doctor who by their accounts you know was very friendly and seemed to be the opposite of the Carolis and and made himself to be somebody that they can trust and come to and they he completely violated their trust and I, I just can't imagine being a young girl and and going through this while you're trying to focus on your dream and I wonder what changes can be made within gymnastics to not create such an isolating situation for these young ladies because there was nobody in the room with him while this was happening and I was reading something and you know there there is a type of therapeutic measure where it involves actually rubbing the vaginal area uh, he practices osteopathic medicine but a person has to be in the room if they're a minor in gloves and he just completely violated that he needs to go underneath the jail traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light switch to energy saving bulbs saving energy saves you money well mike here we are at the end of the show the time where i get depressed because i don't want to leave you guys i had a lot of fun but don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, friending us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 411 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and we'll check you out next week. Yeah!